Good day. In considering Adam's role in the history of mankind, essentially we have three options. One, Adam did not exist in fact, but was a theological construct, a mythical figure to teach theological lessons. Two, Adam was a live human being and the progenitor of the entire human race. Three, Adam was a live human being and the progenitor of the Semitic race, that is, Adamites, Semites, Israelites, Arabs, and Jews, and it would have included Amorites, uh, Canaanites, Assyrians, and so on during Old Testament times. In other words, those specific people groups who were and are Adam's direct line descendants. Now, these options have pluses and minuses. Option one respects science. However, it downgrades the biblical text, it ignores history, and there is no evidence, only supposition. Option two respects the biblical authors, but it ignores science, it overlooks history, and there is no evidence, only tradition. Option three reveres the biblical authors, esteems science, incorporates history, and it is evidence-based. Now, I believe most of you would agree with me that option three is preferable if there's evidence to support it, and that is what we're going to look at today. Not all the evidence there is, just all that can be crammed into the time allowed. If we were looking for the first human, here are some candidates, some of whom lived over a million years ago. Paleoanthropologists can tell us which ones are likely to have been our ancestors and which not, but you can look at your neighbor and figure that out for yourself. If we are looking for the first biblical man, however, the Bible gives us clues. Even before the flood, the Genesis text mentions sheep, tents, cattle, harp, organ, implements of brass and iron. This is not the old Stone Age with caves, woolly mammoths, and hand axes. This is a Neolithic setting, no earlier than 10,000 years ago. The author of Genesis tells us where the Garden of Eden was located. The rivers are in red. We have the Pishon, Gihon, Hydekel, or Tigris, and the Euphrates. The lands are in blue. SR Driver places Havilah in Saudi Arabia. Ethiopia is a bad translation. Cush is father to the Cushites or Kassites, and Asher founded Assyria ancient Nineveh, present-day Mosul, in Iraq. The dry riverbed was discovered from Landsat photos in the 1970s and dubbed the Kuwait River that once flowed from Saudi Arabia, where there is gold, bdellium, and onyx stone, as described in Genesis. This would be the Pishon. The Karke, joined by the Kashkan River, flows out of a province called Khuzistan to this day, in western Iran. That would be the Gihon. Here is the Tigris, and here is the Euphrates. The Sumerian king list begins, when kingship was lowered from heaven, it was in Eridu. Babylonian tradition places the Garden of Eden in the immediate vicinity of Eridu. Here is Eridu on the map, surrounded by the rivers and lands named in the Genesis text. Part of Nimrod's kingdom included Akkad and Shinar. Shinar is the Hebrew word for Sumer. Here is Akkad and here is Sumer. This verse is retranslated slightly but faithful to the original Hebrew. For the Lord God did not cause it to rain upon the land and there was not a man or Adam was not there to till the ground but there went up a mist in the Greek text, the Septuagint, the word is fountain from the land and watered the whole face of the ground. This is what the Akkadians and Sumerians called a fountain. We would call it a water wheel. This was used to provide water to their fields as described in Genesis. You may remember in the flood narrative, the fountains of the deep broke up. The deep refers to any body of water and these irrigation devices were destroyed by the deluge. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. 
This is an archaeologist map drawn in the 1960s to show the irrigation canals in southern Mesopotamia. You can see the Euphrates near the bottom and the Tigris is in the top right-hand corner. Here is the Eden. Eden is an Akkadian Sumerian word for desert or plain. And here is the river. All they had to do was divert water from the Euphrates down an old dry riverbed where the Euphrates once flowed in millennia past. This provided fresh water for Eridu and the garden located within just a few miles. Here is Eridu, modern Abu Sharain today. Eridu was excavated in 1942. After digging through 16 layers of temples, they found this tiny shrine on virgin soil that was dated to 4800 BC. You can see how small it is compared to the workmen. And on top the altar were found traces of burnt offerings. This, I believe, was home to the early descendants of Adam, maybe even Adam himself. This is the village of Ubaid. They were first to settle the region, followed by the Akkadians, or Adamites, and then the Sumerians. Some archaeologists changed the order a bit. Here is Uruk in Sumerian, Arek in Akkadian. Originally, this was Enoch, the city Cain named for his son. The Sumerian king list uses the word Kulab, which means twin cities, Enoch and Arek, that grew into one fortified city over time. This is what it looks like today. After Eridu was smitten with weapons, it says in the Sumerian king list, kingship was carried to Bad Tabira, modern Medina today. Here is Ur, Abraham's hometown. Originally, it was a Sumerian city with the Akkadians and Ubaidans occupying Eridu only eight miles away. Here's the ziggurat dedicated to the moon god Nana at Ur. Shurapak, modern Farah, is where a certain Zayasudra was warned of an impending flood, built a boat, loaded it with animals, and you know the rest of that story. Turning to Egypt, Egyptian creation myths are accounts of the creation of the world. Pyramid texts, tomb wall decorations, and writings date to the Old Kingdom, 2780 to 2250 BC. This would be after the flood, but before Abraham. The Shabaka stone can be seen in the British Museum. The Shabaka stone is often called the Memphite theology due to connections with Memphis. Here the god Ta, the life maker, sat upon his throne. There it took shape in the heart, there it took shape on the tongue, the form of Atom. Ta, the high god of Memphis, was master of destiny and creator of the world. In the Memphite system, Atum was the agent of Ta's will who carried out his commands. Ta is described as the unifier of Upper and Lower Egypt. Self-begotten, says Atum, who in turn created the nine Natiru. Among the Natiru, or deities begotten of Atum, is one called Seth. This is the name of Adam's third son. The pyramids of kings Menare and Nefrekare were inscribed with a dedication dating to about 2400 BC, centuries before Abraham. A first creation arose on a primeval hill out of the waters of chaos. The one who was created was called Atom, and Seth was one of those whom Atom begot. Hymns to Atom honored him as one who accompanied the people and their pharaoh from birth to death to rebirth. Atom would sail his boat across the sky and priests sang hymns. What is the possibility that this is someone other than Adam? How many created individuals do we know of named Adam or Atom with a son named Seth? Unless we believe in colossal coincidences, it should be the same person. 
A question that might arise could be, how in the world did it get there? A possible answer to that question comes from Jewish historian Josephus, who wrote during the time of Christ. Now all the sons of Mizraim, being eight in number, occupied the country from Gaza to Egypt. Hebrews adopted Mizraim to mean Egyptian. All but one of Mizraim's sons left traces in parts of Egypt. Descendants of Mizraim could have been the source of the inscriptions and the knowledge of Atom and Seth who were incorporated into Egyptian mythology. Even the earliest versions of Genesis may have been placed in Egyptian libraries to the benefit of Moses who was educated in Pharaoh's court. Meanwhile, back in Mesopotamia, when the kingship was lowered from heaven, the kingship was in Eridu. In Eridu, Alulam became king according to the Sumerian king list. This is what it looks like inscribed in Sumerian. The Sumerian king list contains a list of pre-flood and post-flood kings recorded in Sumerian. Ethnically, most of the kings, perhaps all, are Akkadian. Seventeen tablets have been found so far. This is MS 2855 that ends with Ubertutu before the flood swept there over. WB62 omits Ubertutu and ends with Sukerlam and Zayasudra before the flood. This is a composite list for comparison purposes. Dumuzi is common to all lists. He is the world's first folk hero. He was the last king to reign at Bad Tibera before it was smitten with weapons and he disappeared. Women wept and wailed at the city gate. This became a cult following that lasted for centuries. Legends were created. Dumuzi and the goddess Inanna, Tammuz and Ishtar in Hebrew. One month of the Arabic calendar is Tammuz. The en prefix means king. The third and fourth on the list would be King Menluwana and King Mengalana, and the seventh patriarch on the right would be King Ak. There is some commonality here. King Enmendarana was taken by the gods and taught certain divine mysteries, and Enoch walked with God. There is a father and son relationship for the last three kings. The name Zayasudra means he who found long life, and Noah lived 950 years. So the last three kings would be the Sumerian names for the last pre-flood patriarchs, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Note that the sons of Cain and Seth both have the en prefix. Enoch reigned at the city of Enoch, and Enosh ruled over Arak. And Cain built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. The first dynasty of Uruk is dated to the 27th century B.C., According to the Sumerian king list, Meskiagasher is the son of Utu, the sun god, and Makar, the son of Meskiagasher, the king of Unug, who built Unug. Here, the Sumerian king list gives the Sumerian name for Enoch, the city Cain built and named for his son. When Cain got the boot after killing Abel, all he had to do was travel about 50 miles north, following the Puritum Iridu Canal to find a settlement of Ubadans, for whom he was given his mark, mentioned in Genesis 4.15. This region is called the Land of Nod in Genesis, so whether we call them Ubadans or Nodites, I don't think they will care much. This chart shows the relevant time periods in the ancient Near East, beginning with the Old Stone Age 20,000 years ago up to the time of the Babylonian exile. The dates are in the middle and the Genesis patriarchs from Adam to Abraham are on the right. 
The archaeological date of 4800 BC placed on the bottom layer of the excavation at Eridu could approximate the time of Adam. The flood at 2900 BC is a consensus date used by many authors and the layers of water-laid clay discovered in at least four of the cities impacted by the flood in Mesopotamia also were given that date. Abraham lived approximately 2,000 years before Christ. If the genealogical number of years listed in the Greek text, the Septuagint, are given weight from Adam to Abraham, it would fit this chart fairly well. A banner discovered at Ur shows Sumerians at peace. The other side shows Sumerians at war. The depiction of a Sumerian priest being given a ram for sacrifice by an Akkadian shows the racial distinctions between them. Note the Sumerian priest has a bald head, big ears, big nose, eye makeup, and no beard. By contrast, the Akkadian on the right has long hair and a long beard. In addition to the fact they spoke entirely unrelated languages, apparently the Sumerians and Akkadians were unrelated biologically as well. One personality appears to relate to Adam of the Bible, the legendary Adapa. Six fragments of the Adapa legend have been found recorded in various Semitic languages. Versions and fragments have been found in Akkadian, Babylonian, Assyrian, and Amorite. Please note here that different Semitic cultures, Babylonians, Assyrians, and Amorites, are all writing about the same man, indicating he had something in common with them all. This is part of the legend of Adapa. Ea made broad understanding perfect in him. He gave wisdom, but not eternal life. He was a sage, son of Eridu. Ea created him as a protecting spirit among mankind, clever, extra wise, holy, pure of hands, a priest. When he came up to heaven, when he approached the gate of Anu, Anu was the father god in heaven, and here we see Demuzi again. Adapa flatters him by telling him how much he has missed on earth, and he was standing in the gate of Anu. And Ezekiel had a vision where he was brought to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, and there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Here we have a man who starts out on the king list, becomes legendary after his disappearance, and ends up recorded in the Old Testament. With this resume, he ought to be qualified to be considered a real person. This is part of one Adapa fragment. What ill he has brought upon mankind and the disease that he brought upon the bodies of men. These are some commonalities between Adapa and Adam. Adapa is placed at Eridu and Babylonian tradition places the Garden of Eden near Eridu. Adapa was neither god nor king, and this is absolutely unique in Mesopotamian literature. They wrote about gods and goddesses, kings, and the occasional queen, but priests never get any press, with this one notable exception. Adapa was created by Ea, the creator god, and Adam was created in the image of God. Adapa was a baker, and Adam was told he would eat bread. Adapa is described as a seer, blameless, clean of hands, anointer, observer of laws. This would be descriptive of Adam, who in theological circles is considered a type of Christ. Adapa broke the wing of the south wind, and Adam was given dominion. Adapa brought ill upon mankind, and through one man, sin entered the world. Adapa spoke with Anu, the father god, and Adam talked with God. Adapa and Adam both called to account for bad behavior. Adapa was clothed by his father God, and Adam was clothed by God. Adapa was offered the food and water of eternal life, and Adam was cut off from the tree of life. Adapa was told to return to earth, 
and Adam was told he would return to dust. From the legend, he takes the boat out and does the fishing for Iridu. He embarked in a sailing boat. Here is Iridu on the map, located on the coast of the Persian Gulf in those days, where Adapa could sail his boat and catch fish. Adapa was a priest in the temple of Ea. With his pure hands, he sets up the offerings table at Iridu. Here is the temple of Ea, and here is the offerings table, exactly as described in the legend of Adapa. How accurately does the legend reflect the facts of his life? Here is Sennacherib, king of Assyria. You can read about him in 2 Chronicles, 2 Kings, and Isaiah. He warred against Hezekiah, you may remember. Sennacherib said Ea gave Adapa vast intelligence. Sennacherib compared his own accomplishments in conceiving the ground plan of his palace and city with that of Adapa who received his wisdom from his father, the wise Ea. Here Adapa is treated as a real person in the mind of Sennacherib. King Ashurbanipal, who was the grandson of Sennacherib, recalled a dream where Asher, who founded Assyria and for whom Ashurbanipal was named, spoke to him, saying, O king, lord of kings, offspring of the sage, that would be his grandfather, and Adapa, offspring of Adapa. Note that not only does Ashurbanipal consider Adapa a real person, he tells us he is related. Ashurbanipal traced his ancestry through his grandfather to Asher and Adapa. This puts Adapa first in the Assyrian line of descent, as according to legend, Adapa had no earthly father. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, recalled the legendary Adapa. Lamenting on an idol he had fashioned, he noted, not even the learned Adapa knows his name. Note here that Adapa was known to both the Assyrians and the Babylonians. This is a summary of individuals from the Near East who are considered to have been created from Egypt, Mesopotamia, and the book of Genesis. Do you notice a similarity between Atom, Adapa, and Adam? Is there a commonality between Ta, Ea, and Yahweh? Does Seth sound anything like Seth? Would it be unreasonable to suggest that all these texts are related. In 1906, Archibald Says argued Adapa should have been translated Adamu on the strength of the character Pa, which had the value of Mu. He went on to explain that a governing principle that would impact the translation was that the character of Mu also carried the value of man. Says recommended, henceforward, therefore, we must transcribe the name of the first man in Babylonian tradition, not Adapa, but Adamu. Charles Horn published The Legend of Adapa in 1917. He included in a footnote Adapa, or perhaps Adamu. In tablets recovered at Tello, Adamu was recorded among the proper names. In records recovered at the Canaanite city of Ebla, one of the governors under Greece Halam, first Eblaite king, was Adamu. A clay tablet was recovered at Khorsabad, 1933-34. A list of Assyrian kings begins with 17 kings who lived in tents. Tudias first, followed by Adamu. Take notice here that we have two branches of Noah's family tree, both from Ham and from Shem, and they are naming their children the same name, a name that would be common to both families. To honor their famous forefather, Semitic tribes preserved the name for many generations, enabling us to identify an important family relationship. By contrast, Adama was not found among those nations not related, the Sumerians, Egyptians, Persians, etc., 
When Akkadian words are carried into Hebrew, the nominative U is dropped. Akkadian Elu for God is L in Hebrew for God. And dropping the U, the Akkadian Adamu is simply Adam. In summary, some people become legendary. The Akkadians and Sumerians had their heroes, Adapa or Adamu Adam, Damuzi Tammuz, Zayasudra Noah, and of course the legendary Gilgamesh. They did everything they could with the means they had to memorialize their kings and notable forefathers. They wrote stories and epic tales that they laboriously copied for many centuries. They named their children in honor of them. And if those legends became a little inflated through time, well, that's what humans do. And we do the same thing today. We have legendary figures in our modern era, while having been actual people, were elevated through story and song to become historical icons. Davy Crockett, Buffalo Bill, Wyatt Earp, Wild Bill Hickok, all real people and all legendary. And some of you all may become legends. I only hope that hundreds of years from now, people won't doubt that you are with us here today. One final thought. The entire Genesis 2 to 11 narrative from Adam to Abraham should be understood as the legitimate history of the Semitic race in Mesopotamia, beginning no earlier than 7,000 years ago not the human race that originated in Africa millions of years ago. For those of you who may want to know more about the fascinating history described in Genesis 2 through 11, here are two YouTube channels that hopefully will put it all into perspective. Thank you for listening.